thank you very much for your presentation. So I am James from Uganda. This is Fazli Dean from Uzbekistan and Giovanna from Brazil. And we'll be doing the commentary for this paper. So the structure of our presentation will be as follows. We shall have a brief summary, uh, introduce a global perspective, and then look at other scenarios that can be extended to the uh, to those in the paper and uh, based on what is in the literature out there and then end with some open questions. So to begin with, uh, the paper that we were meant to read, to read um, basically explores uh, three scenarios for the future of European agro-food system uh, at the 2050 horizon. And um, it's quite important to note that this particular paper makes uh, two main methodological contributions. The first one being the inc it increases the resolution of previous analysis of the European agri-food system uh, using the graphs approach, which has already been uh, explained. And secondly, it also emphasizes many uh, methodological principles and assumptions regarding uh, yield versus fertilization relationships uh, for cropping systems. Um, in this paper, the main scenarios that are uh, uh, examined are one being business as usual, meaning that nothing changes in the, in the patterns. The second one being the agroecological scenario. And then the, the third one being the farm to fork uh, scenario. So these uh, scenarios have uh, there are some characteristics that differentiate them, and these being uh, the population diet, especially at uh, the fraction of animal-based proteins that are uh, included in in the pro uh, in the diet, uh, the type of cropping systems uh, from conventional through agroecological, and the type of life stock farming and its connection to uh, cropping systems. However, even though these different scenarios have uh, various pathways, they have some common ground. And the m more important grounds that we considered were two of them. One is that the land use remains unchanged in all these three scenarios. And also the population does not vary as much. So what's the storyline between these in these scenarios? So the business as usual scenario is that there is basically no change in the structure and operating logic of Europe's agro-food system in 2050, so everything remains the same. And then uh, predicted changes in population and demand for, fo uh, for food is also uh, considered. And there is a constant uh, human debt at current per capita values. Um, however, in this business as usual scenario, there are two dynamics that are considered. One being that there is an effect of uh, a reduction of synthetic fertilizer application to the uh, cropland by about 20 percent, um, and the other is a more a low diet scenario whereby there's an effect uh, of change in human diet uh, to a, he a healthy diet, and in that being uh, considering the protein content. Um, the second scenario is the agroecological scenario. And in this case, um, one, something that is important is that the human diet has less total protein ingestion in it. And also, uh, all agriculture adopts uh, agri agroecological uh, practices. Um, livestock is reconnected to cropping and grazing systems with no input of feeds from other regions. And, but then there is still trade exchanges between uh, different regions in terms of food. Um, and the final scenario being the farm to fork scenario, where there is no change in human diet. There is, however, some imp an important aspect, which is the halving of uh, nutrient losses to the environment and reduction of uh, synthetic fertilizers by about 20%. Um, and two other aspects that are considered in this scenario is that there is at least 25% reach of agriculture space under organic farming and at least 10% of agriculture area, uh, which is under high uh, diversity features. So uh, to uh, 
analyze these three scenarios in terms of the uh, uh, nitrogen flows. So this graph basically summarizes it. And um, the first uh, from 20 at the bottom being uh, the reference period of 2014 to 2019. And when you look at the system nitrogen use efficiency being at 31 percent, and then in the second scenario being the farm to fork uh, 2050 scenario being at 33 percent, and the agroecological scenario of 2050 having the highest uh, system uh, nitrogen use efficiency of 41%. Uh, so I'll pass on the mic to Giovanna to look at the global perspective. Thank you. Uh, well, as James pointed out, uh, the article talks about three scenarios with a super interesting approach, though we are not experts uh, about fertilized land. So our points here are not things that are missing in the article, but like points more economic uh, from an economic approach or socioeconomic approach about how feasible is these scenarios, uh, especially the last of them, uh, the ecological agricultural scenario. Um, first, we're talking about the global interdependence in agri-food system. Um, the global economy operates with an interconnected value chain and changing food production system in Europe means impacting trade and food supply in other regions. Um, so the consequence of changing supply uh, imbalance in balance of payments, basically if you stop import uh, food or agricultural goods in Europe, you're going to affect the exportions of other countries. Um, and that's also impacting Europe's exportion because you're going to imbalance the, the balance of payments. So you need to balance from other side. So that's basically needs to be also thinking. Sorry, I changed that. And that's uh, just to illustrate the exports and imports of agricultural products and by main partners in the EU. This is 2019. Nine, uh, after the Brexit, Europe is uh, now has a uh, surplus in the trade chain on uh, agriculture. So, in the scenario of uh, ecological agriculture, they're going to stop or decrease at least the importance of uh, some primary goods to stop feed livestock, for example, one of the variables in this scenario. So, they're going to balance a bit more this um, this portion of imports, but if you look only of, I don't have the graph here, but if you look only for the crops, they have a, they have a, sorry, a, the opposite of surplus, it's defeat, deficit, deficit sorry. Next <laughs> um, one. So that's other examples. Europe uh, accounts for 34% of African imports. So if you change off uh, also the agriculture uh, system in Europe, you can also affect the exports of European exports to other continents. Um, Brazil exports to 22, 5.5% of uh, agriculture to Europe. So if also um, are gonna affect some developing countries. And also the importance of food in Europe. Um, and the last one is about my part is about the climate change. Uh, the, um, the paper in the discussion part talks a bit about how difficult it is to put into account the climate change, but they're talking more about a perspective for the fertilization of the lands. So they just assume a status quo that the land's going to be, uh, it's going to have the same um, fertilizing um, percent until 2050, but we also need to think about the climate change uh, as a disruptor in the global food chain, chain, not only in Europe. So, water resource utilization, other environmental disasters that's already happening is also going to affect the food supply in all the world. So, it's uh, really interesting also to think about how Europe's going to manage that. In the in the global perspective, I'm going to pass to. Um, yes. So, as an extension to this paper, um, 
Uh, we have there's a, a Jones and others uh, in in their attempt to explain uh, a possibility for uh, transition pathways for the low to middle income countries. Uh, they suggest um, these steps that are, are shown and. Um, from step one to step five, they intend to, uh, they basically make the analysis that of the ideal scenario, the utopian scenario for these uh, low and middle income countries would be to, to have uh, a multifunctional agriculture, agriculture farms uh, with, which have high density, high diversity in landscape, uh, low chemical input use, and improved use um, efficiency, high productivity with both sustainable and resilient livelihoods, and also uh, social equity and diversified diets uh, for human well-being. So uh, this is basically an attempt to extend the possibility of a, uh, an agroecological future for countries that are outside uh, Europe. And um, we also want to thank you again, because this is one of the very few papers that have positive view. Uh, <laughs> and thank you for that. Um, because doing the literature review and other scenarios that come up in the literature, uh, the picture does not seem that, uh, that positive and optimistic. So, um, and also during the seminars. Uh, first, we need to see the revisited uh, scenario. I will uh, mention uh, quickly other scenarios of seeing uh, first the scenarios that was mentioned in the paper. Uh, first, as mentioned by my colleague, halving the nitrogen waste, uh, waste by uh, 2030 uh, is um, in the literature mainly because there are regulations and also many, many uh, discussions on the topic. And from the uh, agroecological scenario, for example, is one of the most suitable ones that can fit this goal, uh, even compared to farm to fork strategy that EU is currently uh, pursuing, and uh, compared to reference, which is uh, completely uh, mm, not sustainable. And we can see it in other pictures that we found from the supplementary materials of the of the papers provided. Um, but um, there is a lot of positive aspects that we can focus on. But uh, since we don't have time, we will focus on some of the aspects that we can uh, mention about uh, and mention and talk about. For example, farm and fork uh, uh, initiative or scenario was mainly criticized because uh, of food insecurities that can follow after uh, f after uh, implementing this scenario. For example, 22 million uh, people can uh, become uh, in a camp enter the food insecurity in the world if EU only adopts the strategy, but in global adoption, that this case might uh, go up to 185 million people. And there is also similar strat uh, scenarios, for example, regional sustainability that has been uh, pursued in the literature for many years, which is uh, relying on local uh, farmers, on trying to meet only regional domestic demands by regions, and um, improving the mo mountain ecosystem systems and focusing on ecological focus area schemes uh, with its environmental potential, but um, they all have their own criticism as well. Uh, but we want to mention as well the integrated climate change model, integrated climate change models uh, that sh can be implemented into discussion while assessing the scenarios because um, there is a very, very um, um, uh, rich literature on climate change models uh, in agricultural system, for example, in EU grain yields may decline by 22%, wheat yields in thousand Europe, for example, expected to decrease by up to 49% as a, uh, as a result of, of climate change effects. And um, more extreme ex uh, weather events, animal disease outbreaks and all of that are expected to slow down the agricultural sector. Uh, as well as in the literature, there is um, a suggestion to include climate smart agriculture and climate climate uh, change models to assess the, the uh, sustainability of, of those, all those scenarios because it is very, very prominent. And when looking at 2050, we cannot ignore the, the climate change effects that can, uh, that can change the scenarios completely. And also Ukraine war and food insecurity was mentioned in the, in the paper. We want to in, 
uh, increase that look a, a bit more because uh, the paper uh, sees U27 countries, UK, Norway, Switzerland, Albania, Serbia, Montenegro, and North Macedonia included in the agro scenarios. Uh, but there is a case to be made uh, for Ukraine accession into the EU that would change the scenarios dramatically, for example. Uh, and Ukraine, uh, for example, is a powerhouse with 55% of its land being arable, 42 million hectares that can uh, be uh, included in the EU region in the, uh, by the 2050 uh, 50, uh, horizon. And there is a potential to be made for Ukraine to contribute for organic food initiatives. A case study of for Poland's in, uh, accession, for example, shows that certified organic farms will increase. And lastly, surging farmer protests that are very prominent in the literature, assessing the agro scenarios. And it is being criticized uh, for lack of uh, clarity and also not paying, uh, being uh, clear with the uh, local farmers as well as other uh, shareholders. But conflicts between agriculture and biodiversity conservation can be avoided. For example, simplistic understanding of farmers could undermine the environmental potential of common agricultural policy but also surveys of all the agricultures from EU shows that they all share similar goals of, uh, with environmental protection as they also have the goals to protect uh, and uh, preserve their lands and uh, farmers to some extent will indigenously adapt to novelty but there is a point to be made that uh, some stakeholders or, or share, uh, stakeholders in the models and scenarios can be under uh, represented or not included into the model so is there a scenario that can benefit uh, from, from incorporating perspectives of all stakeholders that are that are in the in the scenarios, and we want to end with open questions um, that are uh, we are really interested to find uh, to see your point in, for example, your opinions on. To what extent does Europe ag uh, agricultural transition depend on trends in the rest of the world, particularly from the worlds that are being uh, that they are importing from? How feasible is it to introduce socio-economical variables when assessing agro scenarios, as we mentioned? And what policies could be implemented within Europe's agricultural strategy to ensure the resilience of farming communities and not only them, but also other uh, minority sh sh uh, stakeholders in in uh, uh, that can face the fa uh, climate change? How might major events such as imminent Ukraine accession of the EU agri uh, scenarios and policies as a full uh, imp impact? How might the escalating impacts of climate change affect agro uh, scenarios? And um, thank you for your attention. Just un unmute your mic, it's, it's fine. Okay. Well, th thank you for, for these very to the point uh, remarks. Uh, I'm impressed by your summary uh, and also by, by the question you, you're asking. Uh, let me, maybe I will follow the, this list. Um, well, you are completely right. It is difficult to speak of a major structural change of Europe's agro-food system without, uh, as an isolated <laughs> island uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, as I said, my point of view is not that of a policy maker. I am not. Uh, giving advice is about which measure have to be taken uh, here this year for, for changing the system. I am just pointing out that major structural changes are required if we need to change the system uh, and making it less dependent of the rest of the world. Um, That, that's the reason why, uh, in, in my talk, I added a lot of material that was not in the papers that, uh, that you read, uh, showing how, how would the world look like, looks like if uh, the same principles were adopted for, for the change. I, I didn't go 
so much in the details of the other part of the world because I, that, that's a difficult exercise that I, I, I didn't yet, uh, at, at maybe will never do. But uh, uh, okay, uh, but you you see that there is a coherence uh, if you apply the same systems that I applied for designing the European scenario to the rest of the world, it works also. So I am not uh, very egoistically uh, looking at changes that are, benefit, that are beneficial for Europe, ignoring the consequence it can have on the rest of the world uh, at the end of the process. Uh, I am in a way and um, supposing, um, assuming that the rest of the world is going to the same principle that it, it makes the same structural changes. So th that's my point of view, which is a little academic. I, I am. I agree with that. Huh? Uh, but uh, well, that's what I am. <laughs> uh, and, and that's. Uh, well, I, I think, however, that, that it is useful to have some kind of uh, compass, you know, and to see, okay, I don't know exactly which way I will take, but I know I have to go there. And what, uh, what we see when doing this exercise is that no single small measurements, so small policy measurements, as those, uh, su such as those that the farm to fork strategy uh, mentioned and uh, recommend, uh, such measures are not enough. The, the farm to fork strategy, however, it has been attacked a lot by, by the farmers' uh, uh, lobbies, uh, is not enough to reach, to reach even the objectives that the strategy gives to, to itself. Uh, you mentioned that uh, in, in the, scene, the farm to fork strategy, one hypothesis was to reduce by half the losses of nitrogen. That's indeed an objective stated by the European Union. But when you apply the scenario, when you, you calculate what the measures uh, would pro produce, it does not have the nitrogen loss. It does, it does not reach this objective. So much more ambitious uh, structural changes are required. That, that's the lesson of this exercise. But it is an exercise. It is not uh, the proposition of a policy. Uh, and that, that's the, the answer I, I have already given. Okay, how feasible is it to introduce socio-economic variable when assessing agro scenarios? Well, uh, it is certainly possible to do that, but that's not of my competence. So I, and you maybe might have the competence to do that, and I would be very interested in showing that. But I, I am a little, a little, or always a little. Uh, distressed by, uh, uh, <laughs> little annoyed by, uh, by introducing monetary variables. You, you are speaking of, uh, soci of socio-economic variables, socio-certainly economic. I, I don't know exactly what, I, that, what that means. Because uh, as a biogeochemist, when speaking of material flows, I know what that is. Uh, because, uh, you, you know, uh, material flows are conservative. Uh, and that, that's very useful. Uh, monetary flows are not. Uh, because wh what is the price of, uh, of things? How is it formed? Uh, there, there's a lot of arbitrary there. There is... Uh, 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 sorry? No law of conservation. No law of conservation. Uh, on the contrary, uh, all the flows are, are made for, for bringing uh, extra gains, <laughs> uh, for bringing uh, plus, va plus value, or do you say that in so surplus, uh, value. Sur surplus value? Uh, so, uh, and, and that's purely a question of uh, power uh, positions. And I, I personally cannot deal with that. <laughs> uh, although it is at the basis of the economic analysis, contrary to, to what, uh, what is said in general, Th this aspect of power, uh, power questions is, is not often 
put in evidence in economic analysis. So that, that's my position from, from that. Uh, what policies could impl be implemented? Uh, okay, but uh, I already... Ah, yes, in, in the face of climate change. Oh, yes, climate change. It's true, your, your remark, I don't remember, what was completely right. Uh, uh, the scenario I showed you ignores uh, ignore, uh, climate change and the effect of climate change. I assume a constant relation in all regions a constant relationship between yield and fertilization. And, okay, uh, of course, this yield fertilization relationship can change with climate change, and it does certainly. Uh, so, well, uh, that's uh, maybe a problem. The only thing I can say in excuse to that assumption is that uh, that is true also of my reference, of my business as usual scenarios. And even I can add that because my scenarios involve much less intensive crop um, crop of a crop yield fertilization relation, enfin, no, uh, much less intensive fertilization. Uh, let, let, oh, no, no, it's a little bit uh, be, Because uh, of the fact that my scenarios implies lower intensity than current or business as usual scenarios, uh, they are less sensitive to a change in the yield fertilization relationship. I can, I can. Make just a small, a small uh, picture of that yield fertilization. That's the basis. Huh? Uh, this is the one one line, and the uh, the property of the crop relation, the crop fertilization relation, is something like that. This is an intensive scenario. This is a, a extensive scenario. If well, that's for a certain y max, and if you consider that the y max would be uh, reduced by a certain factor due to climate change, then this point would be reduced up to there by here about twenty percent. While this one, I, I should have written that like this because all these curves. Are, are close to the, the one one line here, this reduction would be only 10, something like that. Uh, intrinsically, less intensive scenarios, le less intensive systems are less sensitive to climate change than intensive ones. So the only thing I can say is that my scenario would be less affected by climate change than the reference. That's it. It will be affected, but to a lower extent than the current system and the business as usual system. That's the only answer I can provide. But I am very, I saw a few references you, you give about this aspect that I didn't knew, so I will, I am interested to looking at that. Thank you. Uh, oh. Ukraine accession, yes, of course. Uh, but due to the fact, well, yeah, Ukraine is a very specialized, has a very specialized agro food system. That's a uh, legacy of the former Soviet Union. Huh? It's entirely uh, devoted to cereal uh, production for export. Uh, and that's just these yellow uh, areas in, in the map. That in the scenario would change to a much more diversified agriculture. So, okay, the, uh, <laughs> the impact to the agro food system of Ukraine, if incorporated in my scenario, would be huge. It would be not so huge for the whole picture. Okay.
that's what I can answer to this question. But thank you for, for that. Thank you so much. Does anyone have I have a question that may be a bit off topic, but what are your opinions or do you have any opinions on genetically modified uh, crops and can they play a role in food self-sufficiency, especially it relates to what the discussion said about may not be necessary in Europe, but in developing countries. And like in my country in the 1970s, GMOs played an important role in achieving food crop independence from U.S. imports um, and the... What is your country, sorry? India. India. Yeah, the Green Revolution, had, uh, uh, but also the anti-GMO movement is often associated with, you know, the organic, but I, in, at least as I understand it, there is a lot of pseudoscience in, in you know, their arguments, so I, I, mean, I would like to know your opinion on that. Yes, uh, I answer immediately, or you take a. What do you prefer? Uh, I prefer to answer each, okay. if if it's okay for you. It's fine. Uh, well, uh, okay. Uh, in this scenario, there is absolutely. Oh, oh, the assumption was that the yield fertilization relationship uh, is kept constant, though, so it does not assume any improvement in. Uh, in the techniques, in the agricultural techniques, in the, the, the seeds, in the, the, the introduction of genetically modified uh, uh, organisms and so on. So uh, we assume that we can do with what is existing as f available technologies. That's because it's difficult to make a scenario which is science fiction, uh, assuming that something will be very, very completely changed, the uh, relationships and so on. So we don't assume that. This be, so so that, that's a reason for not uh, assuming any introduction of such new technologies. Another, another reason for not assuming new technologies is that all these new technologies are often creating dependencies. What is already characterizing the conventional industrial agriculture is the fact that the farmer is just between the input industry providing uh, fertilizer, but also seeds and, and so on, and pesticides, and the uh, agro farming, the agro industry, which is transforming his. Uh, so he is, uh, the, the farmer is in between these two monsters and has very low autonomy. And that's clearly a problem. Okay, so we prefer not assuming this kind of thing. But case by case, and particularly if I'm maybe in your countries, this brought uh, some, uh, some progress, I, I cannot answer that. But I, I prefer not assuming this kind of uh, innovations. That's okay. Yes, my, my question relates. Ah, so, yeah, uh, my name is Max, I'm from Germany, and I have a question on how uh, the nitrogen cycle interacts with the phosphorus cycle. And um, also on, the, on that topic, uh, we had a, um, a presentation a few weeks ago on the question like before the Haber Bosch process was invented, like uh, the idea was to recycle human manure for the fields, and if that is also an option that can be uh, pursued. And um, third question is uh, concerning the use of labor on land, because you know, like 100, about 100 years ago, about 30% of the population were working in agriculture, now it's 1%. Like, do the scenarios foresee like the same level of automation on fields, or like a more labor-intensive agriculture, or is that not something you have looked at? Thank you. Okay. Um, well, if we take the, the existing system of organic farming. Well, that's a system which exists. It, it represents, in, in France, it represents about 4% of organic surface. It's low, but in some other countries in Europe, it's more than, uh, it's nearly 30% and in Austria or in Sweden. So we have a, a good idea of what real organic farming systems are. 
economically and uh, socio-economically. Uh, and the fact is that the rate of, uh, of labor uh, per hectare is higher in organic farms than in uh, a little higher, 50% higher or something like that. So probably this kind of scenario would involve more people on uh, working on agriculture, that's for sure. Uh, but in a way completely different, uh, with much more autonomy. This image, this uh, picture of the agriculture uh, in between these two, these two giant uh, industries would not be the same. So the condition of work would be completely different. Okay. So that's something I can answer to your second uh, question. To the f regarding the first one, uh, yes, uh, I, I could have made the same analysis with phosphorus. The problem is that phosphorus is not is often not the uh, limiting factor for, for uh, crop growth for different reasons. Uh, phosphorus, you know, is much less mobile than nitrogen is. There is no loss, no gaseous loss of uh, phosphorus. Phosphorus is very uh, well attached to soil particles, so it is not leached to the hydrosphere. So the losses of, of phosphorus are restricted to the loss of soil itself by erosion. And so uh, the, the problematic is, is rather different. If you add uh, phosphorus to, uh, to the soil, the only way of uh, getting it out of the soil, except when erosion is uh, destroying the soil, but the only way is harvesting products which contain phosphorus. So uh, fertilization has only to uh, compensate for harvest, and that's much more easy. And because in Europe, since two centuries nearly, no, uh, uh, one and a half century, phosphorus fertilizer have been put in great excess because they, they were uh, used much before nitrogen for, uh, fertilizer. Huh? They, they were put in so much excess that now the content of agricultural soil in Europe is higher by 50% than it was initially. And so there is such an excess of phosphorus that in most situations, phosphorus fertilization is no more needed. So you see, the problematic is completely different. Well, it is true that in some uh, countries, and that's particularly true for Africa, I don't know exactly for India, but in the center of the Deccan Plateau, I, I think it's also the case, phosphorus might be still limiting. And so uh, phosphorus fertilization might be necessary. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Björn. I'm also from Germany. Uh, I'm going to sound like a very privileged European for that question, but I'm interested anyways. So uh, if uh, all the countries adopt uh, the agroecological uh, food production system that is much more focused on self-sufficiency, um, do we have to so say goodbye to the luxury of having coffee, chocolate, avocados and bananas in Europe? Is that something we have to say goodbye to? <laughs> That's an, an important uh, question. Uh, it's true that for uh, that, that this process of specialization that I, I described, uh, the Ricardian type specialization of, of several countries, dates back from uh, from before the 19th century with the specialization of whole uh, regions into the production of export crops like coffee, tea, uh, bananas, sugar. Uh, and it's true that uh, even if for Europe, in terms of nitrogen, that would not change a lot the picture. Right? The share of nitrogen contained in tea, coffee and uh, bananas is very small in, in all what I saw. It's true that for these specialized countries, it is a big problem. And uh, he who was showing some, some figure about the, the uh, imports of Europe from, also from Africa, na namely. Uh, uh, you, oh yes, you, you mentioned that uh, Europe was 
a large amount of was uh, yes responsible for a large amount of the import of food to Africa, uh, but that's just because African agro-food systems are in many instances specialized into crops for export to Europe and other parts of the world. But that, that just for compensate for uh, for food stuff that are no more produced in those countries because of their specialization. So yes, may, maybe that's uh, in this picture we should, if not completely suppress, at least largely reduce this kind of exchanges too, for for reason of equity. And uh, that's all of, uh, you could also mention uh, palm oil and cacao, did you? Okay. <laughs> so, um, oh, sorry. I'm Celso, I'm, I'm Portuguese, and my question goes some way in the direction of Bjarne's question, which is uh, regarding space, and I grew up in, in Portugal, in a particularly dry and infertile part of, of, the, of the country, and I was noticing that your framework focuses on, on um, self-sufficiency of Europe in the production of its own um, of its own um, uh, protein. Uh, you mean self-sufficiency of each region? In this uh, case, I meant the Europe. Europe as, as a whole. As a whole, yes. Uh, and what I was and uh, what I was thinking in this case, and then of course, the self-sufficiency is done to avoid. Um, wastage of uh, wastage of fertilizers but what i was thinking is if if there would not be a good argument to be made um to not produce food in places that are not very fertile because naturally to be able to get to get reasonable yields from a place like portugal which is almost a desert you need to use a lot of fertilizers you use a lot of fertilizers to get just a little bit of food well, if we'd maybe be working on something a bit more, a uh, place that's considerably more fertile, there will be less overall need for fertilizers because the, um, because the climate will be more suitable for, for crops. And I just have a second smaller question, which is on your redesigned um, agricultural system for Europe in 2050. Uh, it is all, um, there is no intensive uh, agriculture or... Um, specialized. Yeah. Or specialized, yes. With the exception of a couple of regions in Spain. And I was curious why that was the case. Just, uh. Yeah. Okay. In, in the, the design of this scenario, I don't assume, as a, as a constraint, a constraint uh, self-sufficiency, neither for small regions, nor for the ensemble for the whole of Europe. So uh, the fact that Europe is self-sufficient and is even exporting so, some uh, surpluses is the result of the application of the scenario. It's not an assumption, okay? And, and that's the same for each region. I don't assume any objective of producing some share or the total of the needs of human in each region. The, the region can exchange food and feed. Uh, but I use their potential be, uh, between some limits, uh, some environmental limits. Uh, what, I, what I do is applying the uh, yield relationship, the yield fertilization relationship characteristic of this region, which is calibrated on existing systems, and uh, the fertilization provided by the share of legumes in the crop rotation which is used in agro uh, in uh, agroecological systems there and that produce some fertility that's in that's induce some some uh, yield which is sometimes very low okay that's it that's what the region can produce in under reasonable assumptions and okay, it is, if this is not enough, the, the region, uh, okay. But I don't say, okay, this is too low uh, agricultural production, uh, so let me get rid of that. Uh, let me play golf instead 
in this region or, or whatever you can do with the, with the, the, the land. Uh, I don't say that. Uh, and, uh, uh, let me play golf and, and develop some other, some other activity uh, in, in a purely Ricardian uh, scheme. Huh? Uh, no, why doing that? I, I don't do, do that because I don't want to specialize the thing. There, there are poor regions, enfin poor, agriculturally, uh, agriculturally uh, extensive regions. There are intensive regions. Okay, they live together. They, this region can exchange with the neighbor. Uh, that's, that's it. That's all what I am assuming. But I am not taking the decision of getting rid of agriculture. You, you know, uh, the, the, the reasoning you have is a little bit the reasoning that England did in the 19th century uh, at, at some stage of, his, of its history. England says, let me get rid of agriculture. We will uh, dedicate ourselves to uh, machinery, to steel, uh, to, to um, uh, textile industry, and we will import all our, our foodstuff from America, from uh, uh, India, from uh, Africa. Uh, and uh, that's what indeed England did. That's the first uh, food regime, as, as is often said, uh, which is the beginning of the specialization of the world into very uh, separate. That, that's the, the exact application of Ricardo's principles. And that led to what we now uh, have uh, as a situation of the, uh, the world agro-food system. So, so I certainly don't want to reproduce that reasoning. Okay? Hello, my name is Dario, I'm from Italy. And I really like this, this idea, these transformative proposals. But if you were to uh, talk about those to Italian farmers and, for example, to German farmers that are fighting for much less of a transformative uh, policy, it would be really hard to, 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 to convince them. And I'm thinking in a, in a democratic process of uh, exactly transforming the agro-industry of Europe, uh, this would lead to much lower, correct me if I'm wrong, but it feels to me much lower profitability. We can call it profits, we can call it income, lower income for most, not every single farmer, but for most farms. So either, maybe I'm simplified too much, but either you have to uh, put a lot of, of effort in redistributing resources to avoid to hit strongly the farming, the farmers in this process. And that would mean a lot of money for getting to a, let's say more uh, simple lifestyle. And this would be ex need, needed to be explained to the rest of the, to the consumers. We are spending your money. We are making you pay more for, for your uh, food and you get a bit less or you get less meat. You, you, um, I hope I, it, it's clear money to get to a simpler lifestyle and or just, for example, with a really high tax on, on nitrogen-based uh, uh, fertilizer, you just decide to, to hit that 1% of population that is working in the farming industry or the had that own lands, let's say. How do you, how do you feel like, should, where, where is a democratic process of like going towards such a direction should start from, uh, should, the consumers be the drive or should it be a top-down um, approach or should the farmers be incentivized decide collectively to, to go in such a direction how do you feel about this <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, really uh, uh, these are excellent questions but I cannot answer them uh, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I could say agriculture is a too important question to keep to to get it uh, to agriculture uh, to uh, uh, agricultural people themselves. Well, okay, I, I will not go that. But uh, well, no, I, I I really don't know. Uh, it's very the, what you express is the 
exact uh, demonstration of the contradiction between the economic thinking and the biogeochemical thing. There is a contradiction between these two approaches. That, that's, that's clear. But what does that mean? Uh, what is real life, in fact? Huh? You, you, you know when a, a scientist from the, the GIEC, uh, from the IPCC, uh, went and to, to visit the head of the total energy industry. Uh, explained that uh, okay, fossil fuels should be cut very urgently because of climate change, and uh, uh, the, the chief of the, the company answered, "You know, uh, doctor, uh, in the real life, I have to to buy and to sell uh, oil because uh, people need that. And if I don't do that at the best price, uh, the economy will collapse." And so on. In the real life, what is the real life? Is it that of the economics of the, of the big companies? It is that of the uh, state, uh, the, the, uh, ec the Ministry of Economy uh, calculating its uh, balance of payments and so on? Or is it that of nitrogen flows? I don't know, but uh, there is a contradiction into, uh, be between these two visions of the world. That, that's for sure. So. Or also, one thing, all farmers are not thinking as you describe. Uh, they, are, they are minoritary, for sure, but uh, the ideas I develop are also uh, brought in by some uh, peasant syndicates and uh, some uh, uh, farmer organizations. So there is hope. You just remove the others. Convince them or... Well, the, the big question is, if we want to come to such an equilibrated system, based on sobriety and based on the closing of the cycles and so on, based on some kind of uh, autonomy, is it possible by the transformation of the current system, or does it need some crash, after which we would have no change, no, no choice to change? and to, okay, to rebuild according new principles. Uh, I have no answer about that. But that's, of course, a big question. Some people believe that there is no hope in transforming the current system. I don't think that, but okay, I, I understand that some people can think about, they can think like that. Uh, okay, thank you a lot for your presentation. Uh, my name is Sofia and I'm from Ukraine and I have a question regarding like one of the perspectives that we already uh, discussed, but from the other side. So like currently we saw like what was happening on Ukrainian borders with Poland when Polish truck drivers were simply blocking Ukrainian trucks with like uh, agriculture goods because like po uh, Polish market and like uh, European uh, as a whole couldn't compete with Ukrainian prices for agriculture. So my question would be, how can Ukraine preserve and develop its own agricultural complex during its accession to the European Union? Because we would need to follow very strict rules regarding competition, not to distort the whole composition. And also, as for now, Ukraine is one of the few countries in the world where we have strict rules regarding like uh, land moratorium and restrictions to foreign ownership on agricultural land because we have like this very special soil. So how do you think these rules can change with uh, Ukraine joining the EU? Thank you. <laughs> uh, again, uh, your, your questions are excellent and uh, uh, completely legitimate, but I, I cannot answer to that because I, I don't know enough the condition of Ukrainian agriculture, nor, nor to the rules that Europe would ask to follow uh, in Ukraine to, to join the Union. Sorry, I, I cannot answer that. But, but that's very interesting and, and important. 
Uh, hi, my name is Jan. Thank you for your presentation. I have a short methodological question. I'm interested in to know, like, how do you develop like the a scenario for 2050, uh, 2050? Did you use a kind of optimization model with subject to some constraints, or do you use a more like I don't know qualitative way to build the the 2050 scenario? It's just that that question. In how did you develop like the overall? How much should be crop? What kind of crops should be planted, and in which uh, in uh, in which countries and which with kind of method in of the different that you showed? There's just curiosity about that. Thank okay. you. Okay, there, there is no optimization uh, in the calculation. Uh, the only thing is that uh, okay, the, the constraints are uh, okay a certain population, a certain area of cropland, grassland, and uh, also. Uh, uh, market gardening uh, and the okay and from that you can uh, and a certain y max so a certain uh, yield fertilization relationship in each region and that for each region uh, we use that that produce some kind of first uh, production rates and then we introduce livestock at very low level and we increase the livestock level in each region up to the point that they use all local food and we have to do that gradually because the manure produced by, by these animals uh, also change the productivity of the, the crops and so when an equilibrium is reached we stop the calculation and we have to that, that's very simple and you have in fact that, that's all done with a an Excel file and a small uh, routine uh, that you can find in the paper that's freely accessible. Does anyone have more questions? Do have time? Okay. Thank you so much for the... Ah, so, sorry. Sorry. It's not round two, it's just uh, the question about the, the Spain. Why was there in the model the um, Spain still having uh, specialized, uh, parts of Spain still having specialized, uh, yeah. uh, uh, just, uh, just a particular curiosity about. But that, okay, there, there are criteria to, to say this system is specialized like this, and this is specialized, and they, they, you have seen the, the tree, the decision tree of that. Uh, it, it's just because uh, when doing this calculation, as I did, for this region, we get to a state that that have not a lot of uh, livestock, so that, that is still, or, or, or too much of the, okay, we, okay, I, I cannot explain that in another way. The, 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 the constraints given by the property of agriculture, the Ymax uh, parameter, are such that uh, the, the system is oriented in that way or that way. It's not a choice of, uh, of, designing this region as a specialized region. It is the result of the calculation. Thank you very much, Gilles. Thank you.